Just to underline a point I made at the end of that meditation, a traditional teaching has it that our mind takes its shape from what it repeatedly rests upon. The modern update based on neuroscience is that your brain, literally, takes its shape structurally and functionally from what we repeatedly rest our attention on. And the brain has a bias to be negatively shaped because of a negativity bias uh, if we rest our attention repeatedly on being hijacked by or identified with, carried away by uh, anxiety, anger, fear, greed, self-doubt, self-hatred, low worth, and so forth. So on the other hand, positively, if you rest your attention, as we do in meditation, on experiences of steadiness of mind, increasingly kind of quieting and spacious, and then resting in that sense of spacious presence with an open heart and a sense of feeling already content. It's not just neutral. It's not, it's not just blank. You're already content with the machinery of craving that leads to so much suffering and harm, dialing back, getting quiet itself. Well, as you rest in that sense of being, that sense of being increasingly rests in you. What you dwell in increasingly is what dwells in you. And so then you can carry with you and take with you what's cultivated in your practice. And this is a really important point. The point is the cultivation of qualities in our being, in mind and heart, that are effective in the world and also promote um, happiness, broadly speaking, in ourselves and other people. In other words, we, we learn. We develop, we grow, we heal, we cultivate through our practice, and, and that's, that's the fruit of it. Interestingly, if the fruit of practice ultimately is a kind of unconditional peacefulness in the present that grapples with the world while remaining free and at peace and warm-hearted in your own heart, if that's the fruit of practice, which in many ways it is, a mind free, greed, hatred, and delusion, we can take that fruit as the path, as the Tibetan saying has it, and deliberately rest again and again in the genuine feeling, when you can access it genuinely, the genuine feeling of that which we are heading toward as we rest in the, the fruit. We can take the fruit as the path, which is just a beautiful, beautiful, upward spiral. Okay, so tonight what I'd like to do is continue with the topic that I raised last week, which I've said is the foundation of all happiness, virtuous conduct, which in the Buddhist tradition is one of the three great pillars of practice. In the language of early Buddhism, Pali, these three pillars are described or named as sila, samadhi, and panya typically translated as virtue or morality or ethics, sila, my focus, as well as concentration and mental training and wisdom. So focusing on virtuous conduct. If you haven't uh, seen or heard my talk from last week, I really encourage you to go check it out. A lot of relevant material there at the beginning of this year. That's kind of why I'm getting into it. As we look to the year to come, what is it? What is it? That, is, that most supports the happiness of ourselves and the happiness of others? Well, absolutely, a foundational principle is virtuous conduct. Not as a kind of shaming, fault-finding finger pointing at you from above. Ah, the thumb is coming down upon me. No, taken autonomously yourself as based on pragmatic self-interest as well as heartfelt concern for other people. That's the basis for various do's and don'ts uh, and general principles of virtuous conduct. So that's the context here. To engage in the question of virtuous conduct, inevitably we face gaps, really, between our values in how we'd like to be or we think it would be good to be, gaps between our values and our actions. 
to face these gaps, we do need qualities of self-compassion, uh, self-support, uh, self-acceptance, and it really helps whatever the gaps may have been in the past to focus on the present and the future. What is sila today? What is restraint today? What is encouragement of the good in your life today? What is your own integrity tell you today? What's that quiet voice of goodness deep down inside you today and moving forward into the future? So, you know, these topics may stir up some feelings of guilt or self-criticism or self-doubt. Okay, got it. Try to use them in your focus on, okay, what would help me keep my head high today? Ordinary self-respect today, so that today I can enjoy what the Buddha called the bliss of blamelessness. Um, as someone who wrote me about my previous week, my previous talk on Sila put it, I'm exploring these topics here with you as a teacher and not a preacher. Uh, I'm offering perspectives related to moral conduct as a key and pragmatic vehicle for personal practice. And it's up to you, really, you first and foremost, to decide what you find useful in your own journey. From time to time in the talk tonight, I'm going to slow down for your own reflections. You might want to write some things out. Uh, also, your own reflections and intentions uh, for 2022 this year. These can be charged topics. I encourage you to observe the reactions arising in you and to be mindful and kind toward them. I also strongly encourage you, especially tonight when I get into topics of externalized harms upon others, to stay focused on your own personal practice and to avoid criticizing or advising others in the chat sidebar. Uh, okay, so here we go. Non-harming. I'd like to step back from the details, the specific words, the do's and don'ts, and the implications that we talked about last week, and explore a major big picture theme, not harming, applied both to oneself and to others. The principle of not harming certainly runs throughout the Buddhist five precepts. Uh, it's a, also a bedrock principle in other traditions, and certainly a principle, I say this as a licensed psychologist, a bedrock principle in medicine, healthcare, professional practice of many different kinds. First of all, as Hippocrates said or wrote, do no harm. As we explore this consideration of harming, it's very helpful to distinguish between intent and impact. In other words, sometimes the intentions behind what you do or other people do are neutral or benign, but eh, their impact is harmful. Quick little story here. Our sweet, wonderful daughter, Laurel, when she was maybe two and a half years old, uh, she really liked eating her little Cheerios in milk with a good deal of sugar on it. And she eat them. And one time I was just kind of sitting next to her, just quietly hanging out as a dad next to our two and a half year old daughter eating her breakfast cereal. And when she was done, just kind of very casually, the bowl's right here, you know, on the table, she just swept it off the table. It clattered to the floor, milk, Cheerios, sugar. I think it was a plastic bowl. It didn't break. Everywhere. <laughs> and I looked at her I realized she, she had no bad intent. She didn't kind of even realize the implications. It was just, she was done. It was just out of her way onto the next thing. I had no idea what that was. <laughs> Something else to eat, maybe just whoosh. Okay, her intent was totally neutral. And you know, the impact. So I, I cleaned it up and I probably said something to her. No, Laurel, don't, don't knock stuff over on the table, on the floor. Um, no big deal. This distinction between intent and impact can really free us from no some dead-end discussions of, you did it on purpose. No, I didn't do it on purpose. My intentions were good. I got it. I got it. Bottom line, what were the effects? What were the consequences? You know, what were the results? Uh, as Dr. Phil apparently says sometimes, so how's that working for you? You know, how does it turn out? That's the real question here. Okay. What are the consequences? So harming others. 
in everyday life, we're usually pretty aware of other people harming us. We got that one. And I'm not going to get into the question and the details of whether harms were actually inflicted or whether we made too big a deal out of it, whatever. We're pretty aware of other people doing stuff to us. We're pretty aware of how life lands on us. I mean, I get that stuff. Uh, it's often small things, really, the harms that are done to us. Little things adding up over time, such as being routinely teased in a schoolyard or uh, routinely interrupted by someone at work or routinely criticized by your partner. Any single time that fingernail you know, drags across the bottom of the back of your hand, not a big deal. But fingernail after fingernail, a thousand times later, ooh, it's red and inflamed and things have really added up. Now also sometimes we get harmed by big one-off events, even if it's just a one-off event, maybe part of a larger pattern, but even just a one-off event, such as being sidelined for a promotion because you're a woman or targeted by a cop because you're black. I mean, these are single one-off events too that can harm us. So I certainly want to acknowledge harms coming to you, harms coming to us. Um, and in recent talks, I've started to explore the topic of what to do with people who harm us, including in everyday relationships. And I'm definitely going to be swinging back into that topic in a week or two, a couple of weeks from now, probably, for sure. But right now, how about being aware of how we are harming them? That's what I'm going to focus on here, which can be a difficult thing to look at. And yet, it's really important for our own long-term happiness and healing and growing and awakening. How might we be harming other people? It could be in little ways, like, you know, our righteousness. I have to watch out <laughs> for my own tendency to be right. <laughs> Partly, I'm trained to be right. You know, I'm supposed to be right about something. So it's, it's really a slippery slope from just being correct to being righteous about being correct or positional about it. Got to watch out for that. How do we harm others with that? How do we harm others with our unregulated anger or overstepping their boundaries, talking over them? in breakout rooms, maybe, taking more than our share of the time? How might we be harming others by being dismissive in little ways, including with you know, facial expressions or rolling our eyes, being aware of that? So let's pause for a moment and kind of take stock as you look out to 2022 and no praise, no blame, just clarity with a feeling that you know virtuous conduct is your friend. It's your ally. It's good for you to take the higher road with your head high. As you consider the year to come, what stands out to you as significant ways that you might be landing on other people unnecessarily harmfully, you know, particularly the people that you know well, in your friends, your family, your work, and take a big breath and see if there are some resolutions or intentions that are real for you, real for you. Guidance for yourself may be expressed in language that relate to how you land on others. Like, if I were to do this right now, and I am, uh, I might think to myself, Rick, be exquisitely careful about not interrupting jam. I'm pretty careful, but I could go to exquisitely careful. <laughs> I, can, I can raise the level. We can often raise the level, you know, not harming. Um, I could give some thought to making sure that I'm particularly careful in my tone in emails. I sometimes have with people that I'm trying to work out something with, maybe related to, to something in business. All right. Yeah. Uh, you know, how might you? If you look at this year, harms to others, maybe times that you kind of lose a little control because you've been drinking a little too much. Maybe I can relate to that. I know what that's like. Um, Maybe getting exasperated and kind of dumping your exasperation on others when you don't really need to. Maybe getting huffy. So 
take another half minute or so as you kind of consider the year to come and ask yourself what would help you. Raise your game some in ways large or small with regard to harming others. Maybe it's not your intent, but it's the consequence of your actions. And by the way, if you care to, for yourself, not correcting or criticizing others, but for yourself in the chat sidebar, if you want to put some of your own good intentions, it's a beautiful thing to take a breath and go, you know, I have sincerity. I'm sincere. I have sincere intentions to walk a little bit of a different road this year. Feeling that and knowing that is a really good thing. You can take refuge in whatever the past has been. You know, you're going to walk that higher road. And if you like, you can put in ways you're going to be doing that in the chat sidebar. You can also apply this certainly to yourself. I can see some people doing that too, which is, um, you know, thinking about ways you maybe you've been hard on yourself. Most of us are really hard on ourselves. Oh. We often squelch what's really alive and, and soft and vulnerable, so tender inside ourselves. What are your resolutions there for not harming yourself in the year to come? Maybe you harm yourself and you know it by eating too much of you know, the bad stuff and not eating enough of the good stuff. You know, just factually, can you um, make a commitment to not harming yourself in some key way, including in your health behaviors this coming year? The foundation for this material is not about getting moralistic. The foundation is pragmatic clarity about what fosters the highest happiness for yourself, including yourself entwined interdependently with other people, as well as non-human people, non-human people, non-human beings, you know, non-human animals. So maybe to finish on this, and I'll be moving on. Um, another thing to think about harming yourself is deferring the good, procrastinating on certain things. Maybe you keep putting off talking with somebody else in a heartfelt and vulnerable way because it's scary. I understand that you're paying a price, certainly an opportunity cost, by deferring day after day that heartfelt conversation. I sure wish I had not deferred some important heartfelt conversations uh, with people who are important to me uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Also, maybe there's something you want to do. You want to Write that book, you want to start that business, you want to explore the country. Maybe it's harming yourself to put it off. Maybe you want to dive deep into meditation and really invest that 45 minutes a day in it. And maybe you can commit in 2022 to no longer, in some sense, harming yourself by paying the opportunity cost of deferring day after day that thing which is important to you. I'm seeing many, many beautiful comments coming in through the chat sidebar. Uh, if, you're, if you find that distracting, totally, it's okay. Um, but there's a lot of really wonderful stuff there. Okay, now I'd like to continue and focus on a particular way that people can harm others. 
In economics, this is called externalizing costs. An individual, in other words, or an organization, or a group of people, even a country, even a whole species like humanity, incurs costs of some kind, and then instead of handling those costs themselves, they push them downstream onto others. That's the externalizing of their costs. A simple example is somebody getting a sandwich wrapped to go from a deli and then tossing the wrapper out the window as they drive home. The cost was the wrapper now littering the highway instead of being put into a garbage can. Simple example. I invite you to offer your own examples in the chat, you know, and I encourage you to, uh, you know, be kind of thoughtful about uh, what you might say that could be inflammatory, and especially, you know, maybe cop to your own examples of, uh, you know, externalizing costs yourself. Another example in everyday life is getting stressed about something. And then instead of dealing with that, call it cost, internally, with your own practice, your own efforts, instead of dealing with it, inter it internally, dumping it on other people using them as lightning rods, like your partner, your kids, the dog, other people. You know, that's an externalizing of a cost. In other words, the basic principle here, principle here regarding externalizing costs is clean up your own mess. Or putting it really bluntly, don't dump your shit on other people. Basic idea, okay? So do you get this basic idea, not externalizing costs? Rather than, you know, the idea is, you know, be responsible rather than dumping your problems on other people. You can see it, how important it is, right? We don't like it when other people pass on their costs to us. Suddenly, instead of them dealing with something, it's now our problem. We don't like that. Similarly, other people don't like it when we push our own costs downstream onto them. Basic idea here. This then is a kind of segue into a consideration of harming that occurs through larger systems. And as a very important part of individual practice, we recognize our interdependence with other people, larger social systems, life altogether, the planet as a whole. We interbe, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it. And an obvious follow-on to that recognition of what the Buddha called dependent origination, interdependence, interbeing, it follows naturally that it's appropriate in our personal practice to pay attention to larger and larger systems, including the ways that harms become structured sometimes and routine through larger systems. This is not taking sides politically. This is seeing clearly. So I'm going to talk about it. Get ready. For example, in America, we can certainly see centuries of ways in which harms are occurring systemically. Centuries of harms um, inflicted upon Native people, African Americans, and other people of color with ongoing issues and consequences still today. These are structural forms of harming. If you, like I do, have structural advantages in your country, like I have had and still do and will have advantages as a cisgender straight white male, my advantages exist through unfairly disadvantaging others. The advantages that tilt the playing field, you know, in my direction, tilt it against other people. And that's an inherent aspect of systemic, structural, societal scale advantages that people have. Our advantages involve disadvantaging other people. And that's just a straightforward fact. Another key example of the ways in which harms can occur through social systems is any kind of economic or political system that enables small numbers of people to harm large numbers of people. The few 
harming the many. For example, uh, loopholes uh, in the tax system that enable wealthy individuals to, to pay as much in taxes total as their lowest paid employee. That advantages the few at the expense of the many who still must bear the costs of government altogether, including not just through their income taxes, but through sales taxes and local taxes of various kinds. Another example of systems that advantage the few at the expense of the many are gerrymandering and other manipulations that give disproportionate power, for example, to rural white people in America, some of whom are my beloved cousins who I really care deeply about, and still create a kind of minority rule against the policy preferences of the majority of the country. When that occurs, whether it's Conspicuously in South Africa, you know, until reforms there through apartheid in which a sixth of the population roughly was white and they had enormous power and advantage compared to five sixths of the population that was black and that was African um, by origin, you know, or in America here, we can see concentrations of political power in the hands of the few against the many. Those are systems structurally of harming even if you personally favor the, those particular policies. In the economy, there are also many examples of harms being extended, externalizing costs, such as factories dumping their pollution in rivers or up into the sky, uh, instead of paying the price of cleaning up their own mess. Now, I want to pause here, because you may be already tuning out. I am not an MSNBC commentator. Being aware of these facts, of the ways in which harms occur systemically, is not inherently political. It's just factual. Also, if in any country, the ruling party or some faction or ethnic group or religious group or in, you know, in America, whatever, anywhere, if a political faction or party is deeply entwined with major forces in a country that externalize their costs onto others, that's another simple fact. It's a fact to see. And in the framework of this presentation, how we regard these facts and what we do about them is a matter of personal practice. That's the level I'm talking about here. It's a matter of personal practice. And I encourage you to keep engaging this material at your own personal level of practice. What you do inside your mind about systems of harm and externalizing costs that are occurring out there. Recognizing these externalized costs and recognizing how they harm us and also recognizing our own participation in these costs to others may feel exhausting. It may feel disheartening. Or it may prompt offensiveness and anger. Or it might prompt frustrated fantasies of payback and vengeance. You know? The political is personal. Try to be aware of your personal reactions. That's the level I'm focusing on here. And keep in mind that the deep root of suffering and harm is ignorance. And that seeing clearly, which is actually the meaning of the word Buddha, one who knows, one who sees clearly. Seeing clearly is the path and the fruit of awakening. Now to kind of finish up, I'd like to talk about um, an obvious example of externalized costs, the climate crisis. One aspect of it is that petrochemical companies and their economic and political allies have made and are making and will make enormous, enormous profits from fossil fuels, whose costs include over 100 million tons a day of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases poured into the sky each day. Now, there are uncertainties about the exact pace of the consequences, and some use those uncertainties to sow doubt and muddy the water. But the fundamental physics of adding greenhouse gases is indisputable and completely clear. The fundamental physics are clear. There has been and will be 
and inexorable and inevitable heating of our planet. Our one special, beautiful, blue-green pebble in the sky. Inevitably and inexorably. Stay with it here. The near universal scientific consensus is that humanity's current behavior, people like you and me, will produce only an average increase of about five degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, and with additional warming in the century and centuries after that. Only, quote unquote, an average of five degrees Fahrenheit if we're kind of lucky. Inexorably and inevitably, that warming will lead to vast harms to the weather, food supplies, sea level rising, mass species extinctions, famine, climate refugees, war, and worse. It's real. It's true. Even if you know it, it's okay to hear it again. These harms are already beginning to happen, but the business executives and politicians who are reaping the benefits of petroleum can avoid these costs in their air-conditioned homes and business suites. They can move to higher ground or cooler regions. The current costs of climate change are already being externalized on those who are most vulnerable on our planet. Further, the really intense harms to come will not be faced or felt by almost everyone supporting fossil fuels today. They are being externalized into the future and into the future for many generations. For our grandchildren and their grandchildren and beyond, these costs will be externalized into the future for the next hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's a profound example of externalizing costs. One of the most basic things we teach our children is to manage their own excrement. I can speak from candid experience there. Basically, don't poop in the street. Whether from petrochemicals or other sources such as factory farming, grand greenhouse gases are like pouring excrement up into the sky with consequences inevitably raining down upon billions of people these days and for centuries to come, particularly upon the most impoverished and vulnerable of our fellow humans. Not to speak of, even, the impacts on non-human animals and other species and producing mass extinctions. We can take individual actions to reduce our personal carbon footprint. You're undoubtedly familiar with many of these, such as walking instead of driving, shifting toward electric vehicles, getting solar power, eating less beef, and purchasing carbon offsets. We can hold these actions not as guilt-driven shoulds, but as forms of sila, forms of virtuous conduct that we, that we undertake as trainings. In other words, we can engage in actions related to the climate crisis as personal trainings, as forms of sila, as ways to reduce suffering and to foster happiness for ourselves and others. Still, in addition to what personal efforts people make to reduce greenhouse gases, there remain huge industrial, agricultural, and political forces to address as well. As we contemplate our intentions for this new year, a very powerful and far-reaching way to reduce harms and to practice virtuous conduct is to push for the policies and laws that will draw down, as Paul Hawken outlines it in his marvelous book of that title, Draw Down and Reverse the Forces Driving Global Warming. To conclude, the big picture. So many of the great issues of our time involve an overdue reckoning with externalized costs from the few upon the many. Recognizing these harms and telling the truth about them to oneself and to others is an important step to reducing them, and thus an important aspect of your own sila, your own virtuous conduct, your own psycho-spiritual practice. It can also have ripple effects in the wider world. The great positive developments of our time have come from this kind of moral clarity, whether with regard to environmentalism, 
gay rights, civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. Virtuous conduct also expresses itself in doing what we can this year, 2022, personally and politically, to oppose the people and organizations who are in effect dumping their garbage in the street. It's okay to talk about this. It's not a taboo. It's not something we should leave out of our Buddhist practice. It's not anything we should leave out of our spiritual practice. For example, there are many accounts in the Buddhist tradition of deeply practiced individuals calmly confronting rulers with the harms they were doing to the common people. As they say in Zen, nothing left out, including larger systems of harms and externalizing costs. As you may know, I focus almost entirely on the personal level of intervention, and I'm certainly going to continue to do that this year. That's where my own personal training is, what expertise I have is there. Still, as we enter 2022, which in America and worldwide is shaping up to be a key turning point, for better or worse, it seems appropriate at the start of this year to highlight the broader implications of virtuous conduct. Okay, so I hope I've stayed mainly in the mode of teacher rather than preacher, uh, although I probably slipped there a little bit. Well, what do you make of all this? Virtuous conduct, non-harming, externalizing costs, large and small, really important thing to think about. All right, so I'm taking a look at um, comments, looks pretty good. Uh, I have written this out and I will post this and, you know, and that's good. Well, I appreciate the comments that are coming in. Um, trying to see if there's any kind of question. Tick, tick. A lot of people are putting in other resources. It's great. I'm not an expert on the climate crisis. Uh, on the other hand, it doesn't take expertise. What's the line from Bob Dylan? yoo -ha, my hero. Uh, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. You know, it doesn't take an expert to discern the very, very basic physics of dumping carbon dioxide every day into the sky, half of which stays up there. Uh, the other quarter comes into the ocean, and another quarter is absorbed by trees and plants and green things, etc. Okay, um, that's uh, people putting in ideas. Anybody want to talk with me individually about this? I'm not going to get into a big political rant. I'm not. I'm not going to get into a lot of details about the right way and the wrong way to deal with the climate crisis. I'm really interested in the personal, psycho-spiritual matter where the rubber meets the road of how we address the harms we do to others, including our participation in larger systems that harm others, and how we support ourselves in seeing with clarity the externalized costs that are landing on us and others that we care about. That's what I'm really interested in getting at here. Okay, Tony Stokes. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Tony. As usual, you may have heard me say it. Please be succinct. Talk about something of general interest, blah, blah. Here we go. Asking you to unmute, Tony. Thank you. Hi, that was an excellent talk. Um, I, I want to say timely, but it's really not timely. We're behind the times, yep. but it's always timely in the sense that we have to look at the present and move forward. I wanted to speak to the virtuous conduct and um, raising our awareness and bringing clarity to um, personality traits or the way we interact that we're already sensitive to, that we're already aware of, but what I really appreciated was the way you put it into context tonight. Mm, thank you. Principles in terms of looking at it from a, a more spiritual point of yeah. view to the Buddhism rather than just uh, beating myself up. Oh, I, I over talked again, or I didn't respect a boundary. My daughter's very good at uh, saying boundaries, mom. That's our cue. <laughs> <laughs> She's 24. And that's her safe know. word, right? That's, that's her safe word. <laughs> safe word. I got it. Bad. Well, thank and you, Tony. So, yeah. So I, I just appreciated the, the perspective that you brought mm -hmm. to it to, oh. for her reflection. 
Well, thank you very much, and definitely the Buddhas and Buddhist perspective, and I appreciate that. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm going to move yeah. on now to Aaron, and then hopefully Mickey. Okay, take good care, Tony. Thank you. All right, Aaron, I'm asking you to unmute. Um, great. There, there you go. go. Um, this, is, uh, this is going to be kind of like a big, a big sky question, um, but you had talked earlier about the harms that we do ourselves. Um, yeah. I'm extremely critical of myself, even when I'm don't when I'm not aware that I'm being critical, because I think that that's how I improve. That's how I yeah. get better. Um, and I'm only really able only able to give myself a break when I hear you or somebody else. Yeah. Say in the moment. Yeah. In the moment, when I'm meditating by myself, it's excruciating. Can I ask you a question? I don't there. Aaron, can yeah. I ask you a question? And I'm I'm being a little quick here, so I, I apologize for the I apologize for the rudeness of it. Are you are you able to distinguish between guiding yourself and criticizing yourself? No. So why don't you right now, just kind of like I said early on, like it's better when people give themselves advice. What could you tell me right now about the distinction between? Guiding oneself and criticizing oneself. It would have to be a theoretical. Yeah. Well, start with theory. That's okay. Start with ideas. Uh, criticizing myself is um, judging. I think you even displace it to another person even. What would it be like? Like you could do it for me. What a play. All right. Tell me. Okay. Okay. It, yeah. It's real. Um. Uh, if I was guiding you, I would be far more compassionate. I would say, um, uh, take your time. Um, you have some inner wisdom. It's okay if you don't, if you're, if you're frightened, it's okay. Whatever's coming up for you is okay. This is really sweet. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for me, it's, you didn't get up on time. This is the second day in a row. You haven't done this. Um, you're never going to feel better yeah. if you keep doing this. And then it yeah. just feels like, like totally it feels right. awful. And I hear the, the tears behind it. And I, I want to, in a funny kind of way, you can use that strong will for self-improvement to improve guiding yourself rather than criticizing yourself. You can, you have a strong work ethic. You can work at guiding yourself rather than criticizing yourself. And also you can, for example, find the difference between encouraging yourself, which is a little different from guiding yourself, encouraging yourself. And you can see even the difference between nurturing yourself and criticizing yourself. Yeah, and I have a hunch that you know how to guide others. You did it to me right there. You know, you touched my heart. You're a natural. <laughs> you just have to apply that superpower to yourself. So, you know, you probably, you know how to guide, you know how to encourage, and you know how to nurture. You know these things. And you know how to be willful and strong and to regulate your attention and to bring it back to something. So you can deliberately focus on and become interested in. You're good at, you know, you're good at getting good at things. Get good at guiding yourself, you know, get good at encouraging and nurturing yourself. And you can study on it. Literally, you can start thinking about what is involved in it. You can model people who do it. You can watch yourself guiding, encouraging, and nurturing others. And then th imagine what it would look like to yourself. It, it can start out often pretty willful. You'll forget a lot. You know, it can start out more conceptual, like literally write out little talks to yourself. Maybe start with the talk to other people because you can do that more naturally and then switch, just change the name <laughs> from Susan to Aaron or Rick to Aaron. You know, you develop it, you get, you train in it. And then increasingly you start to open up to the feeling of it. Like, you know, the feeling of criticizing yourself. There's a different kind of energy or feeling in guiding. It's clear, you know, we can guide with some 
firmness. And we can guide with some clarity about, hey, you messed up, all right? You know, you drove into a tree. Don't do that again, <laughs> right? You, 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 but okay, but it's about guiding yourself in a better way without being harsh about it. And you can feel also the feeling of encouraging and, and nurturing and the rest of that. So that's what I would really, really encourage you, you know, and guide you uh, in doing here. How's that sound? Okay, good stuff. This is a really beautiful and important thing. And to appreciate also that you can still walk the higher road and be that good person you aspire to be while without that harsh self-criticism. You can walk the higher road by guiding, encouraging, and nurturing yourself, not beating yourself up. I just want to beat myself up. I just want to quit. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Good point. Yeah. Beating yourself up is actually anti-mission. It's, it's not... Um, it's not a winning strategy. Okay. Thank you very much, Aaron. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to try to f finish up real soon. I think I can take you, Mickey. Uh, I'm asking you to unmute Mickey Chen, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to you, Jim Quayle. Okay. So let's see here. So Mickey, I'm un can you unmute yourself? Okay. Do you want to turn uh, on the camera or no? Okay. Great. Okay, no, very, very I, short, I, short and sweet. What's your question? Okay, you know, I agree with what you say about a lot of things, but it's the consumer, you, the consumer, that is driving the corporate machine. You know, it's to you some extent. But you know, Mickey, I'm not going to get into that one. No, but it's the personal usage of resources mm. that we don't respect. One I, use. I will agree with you that we have a lot of power I, there, and I think there are yeah. other forces too. Yeah, but if you, you make me upset when you don't take it. It's a personal consumption that causes a lot of this stuff. The lobbyists and their allies and the whole history around that, especially they're, if you look they're, at... They're, they're, they're too. I agree. Okay, they're good. Too. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying they're too. And I would say, you got to yeah. emphasize the consumer. Great. Well, that... So Mickey, I said all those things about personal choice and action. That's the that's the key, I think. Let's do it. Because okay, good. So Mickey, thank you. I'm going to keep going. I agree with you. Okay, let's do ahead. the okay. consumer stuff. I agree stuff. with you. Yeah, I just that uh, kind of upset me when you focus on the big guys and not on the little guys. Yeah. Well, I I want to focus on both. I'm just saying both big guys and little guys. Okay, thank, thank you for you. emphasizing. No, it's good. Thank you, Mickey. I got it. And thank you for your other input to me also about my own personal orientation to practice. Uh, your question there. Yeah, later for that. Okay, thank you. All right, Jim Quayle. Great. Hello, hello, Jim Quayle and partner. Hello. I recognize you all. Um, we saw you many years ago at uh, UBC. This is Carmela. I'm going to ask the question. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so my question is, how do you deal with the sense that it's so big and yeah. you can do all that you can at a personal level, but the forces outside of us are so huge that, um, you yeah. know, we, we, we're unlikely to win is, is that sense that, you know, you can't really change it. Yeah. It's a really huge topic. And. Um, I've, I've reflected on it a lot personally. It, it gets me right in the marrow of my gut. You know, it's very real. Uh, I'm a parent and I think about, uh, you know, our children and their children. Also, I personally care a lot about kids in general. It's been a very strong motivator for me and, um, and the planet as a whole. And you can just see, we can be sick at heart at the irreversible consequences of so many things. Maybe, 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 you know, some giant scientist in 200 years is going to figure out a way to suck the carbon out of the sky, and maybe they're going to do it even sooner, but probably not. I mean, we are headed for, um, I'm trying to find a word that doesn't involve swearing, but we're, in, we're, in headed, we're headed toward a, a huge mess, even at, in the best scenarios in a lot of ways, especially for the most vulnerable people. All that's true. Okay. Meanwhile... Uh, I, what I find is that whatever is happening in the world altogether, we can feel better ourselves 
knowing that we've done what we can, period. So if we're interested in reducing suffering and promoting well-being, it's on mission to know that we've done whatever we can in our circumstances based involving also our constraints of time, money, aging, and so forth, that we've done what we can. That's reason enough. Even if the world is going to hell in a handcart, we can take refuge in knowing that we've done what we could, even if we can't stop it from tilting over the edge of a cliff, period. Second, um, I have a lot of hope for the long haul. I'm pessimistic in the short term, and I'm optimistic in the long term. You know, humanity is scruffy. Humanity has found many, many different ways to live. And definitely, even as large-scale systems that make it in large-scale events that make it into the history books uh, were terrible and terrible consequences for many, many people, and I'm not in any way, shape, or form minimizing that. Meanwhile, many, many people found ways to live reasonably well, raise their children, have their friends, engage their spiritual practice, and leave the world a little better locally than they found it when they eventually pass away. And I think that that's true. And I take comfort in collective action and uh, joining with other people, trying to help things be better. I take comfort in that. And I also take comfort in the, the, the voice of wisdom, really, the chorus. It's voices. It's a chorus of wisdom from many traditions in many places, large and small, running through humanity. And that wisdom, if you look back on human history with all the kings and queens, all the despots, all the rulers, all the tyrants, and all the rest of that, still, the voice of wisdom, spiritual wisdom and psychological wisdom, humanities-based wisdom, human wisdom, has persisted. It has not been defeated. It has not been defeated. And we can add our own voices to that chorus, whether it's by making a comment in the chat sidebar or having a role like me. We can add our voices to that chorus. And I just think that's a beautiful thing. And I'm hopeful that in ways known and unknown, seen and unseen, you know, that, that chorus will continue into the future in ways that will benefit generations for thousands of years to come. That's my two cents. Yeah. Let's keep singing. You know, let's keep rocking in the free world. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good to see you again. Um, I hope to do a program for uh, up there in BC with um, British Columbia Insight Meditation Society at the end of 2023. Kind of wild, but anyway. Okie doke. Well, we are going to finish up the formal portion of our program here. I encourage you to kind of just let it sink in, whatever's been useful for you, you know. Especially as Mickey Chen pointed out, focusing on our own personal circle of action, our own personal circle of influence, as Stephen Covey talked about a long time ago. What can we do to reduce harms to ourselves and to others, including harms that travel in in structural and systemic ways through externalizing costs. I'm going to continue this next week and gulp. We will inevitably, I'm sure, be talking about this in a time of great plague. And um, I will indeed definitely get to uh, talking about you know, what we can do more immediately in our relationships. But I wanted to open up these topics this year.